today on Ag News Daily. This is our fifth field day that we uh, that we're hosting. It's going to be just outside of Buffalo Center, Iowa. Starts at 2 p.m. We're going to have a host of uh, really interesting people there. We're going to have plot tours. We're going to have a farmer panel and uh, have a bunch of farmers, including myself, that are doing some of this farm weird stuff for people that want to just come and ask questions. The goal of it is is to have people come in and inspire other people to go home and 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 try this stuff and put it into action and like I said, spread this kind of grassroots uh, movement of innovative farmers trying to find solutions for themselves. Welcome back to the weekly edition of the Ag News Daily Show. Tanner and Delaney sitting really close together today. We're back in the saddle together. It's been a little while, Tanner. It has. We've all each had our time on the road, and it's fun to be back here together for the listeners. So excited to jump into some news this week. But have you been to the Iowa State Fair yet? I haven't. I'm going today. Oh, today? Today. That's great. I think we're going to go this weekend, take the girls down there and see but it sounds like a lot of great things and should be some good weather. We've had some mild and showery weather here in the U.S. Corn Belt this week. We have hopes of warmer and drier weather in the upcoming week. A system is bringing scattered showers and thunderstorms throughout the Midwest over the next couple of days. Leaving eastward this weekend, temperatures will remain mild and are forecasted largely to stay that way through the end of next week. Though it gets drier next week again, conditions are largely favorable for filling of corn and soybean pods. So, Kind of a good end to that growing year, at least here in the Midwest. That's right. And we saw crop conditions report as much. 94% of the corn crop has reached the silk growth stage, according to the USDA's weekly report, up from 88% last week and on par with the five-year average. 60% of the corn crop across the states has reached the dough growth stage, up from 46% the year prior and ahead of the five-year average. 91% of the soybean crop has reached the bloom growth stage, up from 86 the week prior, and ahead of the five-year pace, while 72% of soybeans have also reached the pod growth stage, up from 59% the week prior and ahead of the five-year average. 93% of winter wheat has been harvested, up from 88% the week prior and ahead of our five-year average. And 18% of the spring wheat crop across the top six growing states has been harvested up From the previous week, Tanner. So I think farmers are getting itchy to get out there and get things planted. But crops are looking really pretty good here in central Iowa. Yeah, certainly been a lot of yield estimates being done. But we also saw a report from the Association of Equipment Manufacturers, AEM. They just released the July 2024 tractor combine sales report. And in July, the U.S. sales of four-wheel drive tractors surged by 18.6% compared to the previous year making a 5.2% increase. Despite this positive trend, agricultural tractor sales fell overall by 14.1% in July and down 119 year to date. Combine sales saw a significant decline, also dropping 19% in July and 17% year to date. Kurt Blades, the AEM's senior vice president, highlighted that July rebound in four-wheel drive tractors as a positive development following the slowdown in May and June. However, he noted, There's going to be challenges, particularly in the subcompact tractor market, which is softened after years of strong performance. Blades emphasized the importance of passing the farm bill to provide the stability that farmers need to make these purchasing decisions. In Canada, four-wheel drive tractors sales saw even more substantial increase with an 88% jump in July, compared to us, which is a 17% year-to-date jump. Canadian overall tractor sales decreased by 13%, down 15.5% year-to-date. So we are seeing a little bit of a slowdown. Yeah, I think that's no surprise as we're starting to see commodity markets continue to reflect that as well. But the USDA said on Tuesday it's going to expand bird flu testing of beef entering the food system as a response to the ongoing dairy outbreak. USDA officials, in a call with reporters earlier this week, along with staff from several U.S. health agencies, said that tests will begin in mid-September and urged livestock workers to remain vigilant. Nearly 200 herds in 13 states have contracted bird flu since March after the virus jumped from wild birds to cows, according to USDA data. The expanded testing will continue for the rest of the year and will focus on beef from dairy cows, according to USDA's Undersecretary for Food Safety. Eric Diebel, Deputy Undersecretary for Marketing and Regulatory Programs, said the USDA is confident that the current bird flu testing systems will help 
the nation's dairy farmers and now beef farmers as well. That's right. And in addition to this, Colorado has also implemented mandatory weekly milk testing for dairy farmers on uh, July 22nd. And this is since then detected 10 additional positive cases in the state. Farm workers remain at risk of bird flu infections, so as long as the virus circulates among livestock, 13 poultry and dairy workers have contracted the bird flu since April, according to the CDC. The CDC is working on expanding its surveillance wastewater testing of the H5 virus in advance of the fall and winter flu season. So more news there. Well, Tanner, as we turn our attention to some agronomic use, the use of fungicide is an additional cost for farmers, but it also comes with complex decision making that has to happen. With this challenge in mind, BASF has introduced a new unique spray timer tool to the market for more efficient fungicide management, now through their Exarvo field manager that alerts users when a fungicide treatment is needed for a specific field. This spray timer tool provides users timely alerts based on existing disease situations, advanced growth stage, and disease prediction modeling, which includes weather and historical field data. If a fungicide treatment is required in a field, spray timer recommends the best application timing to help ensure farmers' investment in fungicide is efficient as possible. Spray alerts from Exarvo Field Manager also provide users with an overview of daily spray weather conditions while connecting to a comprehensive product list to create tank mixes. Spray Timer also provides the user with information on specifically where to apply and allow users to be notified before yield-reducing stress occurs. With this new Exarvo Spray Timer, users can also gain access to prescriptive fungicide timing and field placement alerts, and this spray timer works complementary to the Exarvo Seed Select and Field Manager tool, Tanner. So interesting there that we're going to see maybe some new ways to be a little more efficient on the farm next year. That's right. Well, Delaney, on X, I saw one of our followers was doing an experimental fungicide test. He flew a drone, an airplane, and had a high clearance sprayer going in the field at the same time on the same day applying the same chemical, the same fungicide. Obviously, at different rates based upon the use case, but uh, it'll be interesting to see those results. It certainly will, Tanner. We also saw this week in a speech earlier that U.S. Agricultural Secretary Tom Vilsack detailed the potential of jet fuel coming from ethanol. Even if this process to make it work is going to be cumbersome at best, Vilsack spoke Thursday to members of the American Coalition for Ethanol holding its annual meeting in Omaha. He credited the biofuel producers for helping support farmers and the rural economy, marking that synergy. While he remarked that corn prices were not where the administration would like them to be, he said that the biofuel will remain a huge market opportunity, and especially new markets such as the sustainable aviation fuel will continue to provide producers with opportunity. He said that that biofuel producer group will need increasingly need to turn to new markets increasingly such as sustainable aviation fuel, to capture the incentives and help the airline industry lower its emissions. So it sounds like there's a partnership coming forward there, Delaney. While the Biden administration has been questioned about their support of electric vehicles, Vilsack says that the EPA has blocked the oil industry from taking advantage of small refinery exemptions, or SREs, that were frequently granted under the Trump administration. The secretary also said that more E15 is being sold, which is good news, as the EPA has granted summer waivers and is starting in 2025, eight states will be able to sell E15 without a summer waiver requirement. All of that has led to record sales of E15 in the process. The secretary has also acknowledged that in his remarks, there were a lot of disdain by folks after the Treasury announced in May for the on-farm requirements of the 40B Sustainable Aviation Fuel, or SAF, tax credit. We sat on a call with Mitchell Hora explaining more of what that handed-out instructions were. The Treasury guidance requires the bundling of no-till planting, nutrient management, and cover crops, but still, he felt confident that the administration had done a lot to support rural Americans over the last four years. So it seems like there's going to be some campaigning uh, at least comments and definitely going to be a focus in the Midwest as we look at these presidential candidates. 
a, li- a little bit of maybe campaigning through some of his remarks there as he was recapping the industry's uh, successes over the last year. Yes, certainly so. But we have a great interview for you today. We're going to talk to Zach Smith, known as the Stock Cropper, about a unique field day opportunity coming right around the corner. Well, listeners, I'm excited to bring on, uh, I'm going to call him an old friend of ours. The fact that I've been following Zach for a long time has been a great pleasure of mine. When I first picked up his Twitter account, because this was before it was X, Delaney, mm-hmm. stock cropper. I had to figure out what in the world was a stock cropper. So excited to have Zach here to explain that to our listeners for those who haven't met him yet. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, guys. Appreciate it. Well, let's start first with your background. Tell our listeners a little bit about who Zach is and uh, what you've been up to. Yeah, so I'm a uh, now my my job is uh, I'm a corn and soybean farmer in northern Iowa. Um, I've spe- but I spent most of my uh, adult life here uh, in ag retail of various forms or fashion. Uh, but in 2020, 2021, I uh, kind of had a change of heart, and this thing called the stock cropper was born, which I'll explain here. Uh, and I also had the opportunity to pick up enough acres where I could quit working in retail and uh, just focus on farming and be an entrepreneur with trying to develop this thing called the stock cropper. So the stock cropper in a nutshell uh, was an idea thought up in early 2020 when commodity prices uh, adjusted for inflation were about how they feel this morning, uh, which is garbage. Uh, And it was me and a couple other farmers, um, Sheldon Steamer and Lance Peterson, that uh, had this idea to you know, we had to figure out a way to raise revenue without increasing costs. And uh, so we thought differently about what a field could look like in order to do that. And so we used, uh, we had an idea to integrate livestock in the middle of a cornfield by inventing the world's first multi-species mobile grazing barn. And so uh, thankfully we uh, had an engineer on the team that uh, uh, allowed us to basically do that. And uh, we did that in 2020, successfully deployed it uh, using the principles of strip intercropping. So 20 foot of corn, 20 foot of pasture, and then this mobile grazing barn that contained uh, three or four different species that first year, sheep, goats, pigs, and chickens, all in a big wagon train moving with a solar-powered electric winch. And since 2020, we've gone on to, um, you know, continue to, to demonstrate the system on our farm outside of Buffalo Center, having field days. Uh, we partnered with other companies like Don Equipment and Joe Bassett to help uh, bring autonomy features to it so this thing can move autonomously on its own. And um, and along with that, the other thing we do is not just with the animal integration, but trying to really focus on these concepts where uh, by changing the arrangement of the field, farmers can substantially increase revenue without increasing expenses, which that's the holy grail, especially right now. You know, anyone... I used to have this, you know, the job of selling the the two and a half gallon solution in a jug, and uh, I know what the I know what the stats are on this, and I know what we're working on uh, as a farmer now, not connected to retail. This is this is where the secret sauce is, and so um, that's that's really what we've been focused on, and what people can expect to see if they come to our field day uh, next next Saturday. So. I'm just blown away because I think that, like you mentioned, the holy grail is increasing revenue without increasing expenses. And I think a lot of farmers are starting to scratch their head and say, okay, how do we get through these next couple of years of lower commodity prices? But even thinking outside of the box like that, I think is really challenging to do. How did you find the inspiration or even come up with these wild hair ideas that you that we see today implemented on your farm? Uh, well, I it, the roots of it started with... Um, friendships that developed in kind of a fringe of agriculture 10 or 15 years ago. I was interested in strip till. I met another guy that was one of the only ones in our area doing it. And uh, he had this idea of like, oh, I heard about strip intercropping and maybe we should try this edge effect thing. And and so he first did it and then I did it. Then we had an idea in 2013 about what if we could create the edge effect across the entire field of corn by doing twin row 60 inch or 90 inch plantings and We've been just kind of tinkering around with that concept, but then, you know, we, you know, <laughs> when things really got bad is when we got serious. And I think a lot of people are feeling the same thing right now. It's like, it's hitting the fan, you know, th- corn's 360 this morning in Scarville and 903 for new crop beans. And like, that doesn't work. And that was the same space we were in. And so it was out of necessity that we kind of 
uh, evolved. And now it's been, it's been awesome because of Twitter and, you know, doing things like this, I get to meet all sorts of other, you know, farm weird village idiot people across the corn belt that are trying to find a way to, you know, uh, come out of this. And, uh, and, you know, it's, it's been a fun journey over the last uh, five years. There's definitely two groups of farmers, the farm weird, which is the way you, you refer to them, but the ones that aren't going to give up, right? the ones that are going to just put their head in the sand and keep doing it like they always have been. And then there's that group that will just keep doing it over and over. I was watching a TikTok this morning before Delaney showed up, uh, not on time, like I told you she wouldn't be. <laughs> and it was from Ag PhD Day saying that that outside row of corn should have the potential of four to 500 bushel per acre. If you properly fertilize because of that excess sunlight. So what are you seeing the benefits of your strip cropping, if that's the best way to describe it, when you are using this various spacing? Well, if you're going to just look at strip intercropping, like in the conventional sense with uh, corn and soybean production alternating. So last year, it's it's pretty easy to expect that we can increase uh, overall corn yields by about 20 to 30 percent versus a static planting of just regular corn. Now, the beans take an inflection hit from that, from the shading of the corn, uh, but the gain in corn yield outweighs usually the loss in the soybean um, space in between. And so you're still gaining, uh, you know, net revenue on the farm with basically just, you know, planting the crop. And I do it all in one pass, so it's simple, you know, corn and beans in the planter at the same time. Um You know, the thing that's really interesting about stock cropper and why we've got a lot of attention about this is, uh, yeah, we can grow a lot of corn last year in our schematic without any additional fertility other than nitrogen, no bugs, you know, no bugs in a jug, anything like that, just where the animals had gone the previous year. We grew uh, in our 10 foot arrangement, we grew 324 bushel corn and 305 bushel corn in our uh, 20 foot or eight row strip of corn that was on top of where the animals had fertilized the year before. And then in between, we've got stocking densities that produce us about somewhere between, you know, depending on the, you know, pasture raise market rates, uh, somewhere between fourteen to $15,000 of gross revenue uh, on per acre that we have the barns running. So um, it's, you know, it sounds great, uh, but, the, you know, the, the biggest obstacle to scaling it is where, you know, you've, and I've talked to you about this before you know, Tanner on what we've done podcasts is access to, you know, meat processing that could actually do that at scale. So we have a concept, we've proven that it works. Uh, we continue to show that, um, and be incredibly productive. Um, but that's, you know, that's why I've pivoted into some of these other venues where like, what can we impact things on a broad acre scale with? And a lot of these, uh, different, different planning schematics, um, you know, what folks like uh, Jason Mock have been doing out with his relay, wheat and soybeans and, and, uh, you know, a lot of other folks uh, that are innovative all across the country are trying to work on these things. This is nothing that's going to get sponsored by the big companies, right? Because, uh, this is not a, you know, this isn't something that's going to return, uh, to the shareholders, you know, to potentially cut seeding. I mean, last year I had a, a hybrid, uh, a corn hybrid yield, uh, in 60 inch rows with only a 16,000 broad acre population yield 252 bushels. Oh, at wow. 16,000. And so I don't know if, uh, if people are going to hop on the bus to support that. So it's, it's kind of a grassroots farmer, uh, led initiative. And, uh, so, it, you know, it's not like we got millions of dollars that are disposal to research and, and fund all this, but, uh, who knows, maybe somebody sees this someday and wants to throw some money at, at this group of village idiots and see what we can come up with. So I just have so many questions. I'm sure we're not going to get all of them answered today. But Zach, I want to dig into a little bit more of the mobile grazing unit or the mobile system. How does I've yeah. seen videos and I was like, what am I even looking at right now on your X account? But um, how does yeah. that work? Yeah, well, we call them cluster clucks for a reason because they're, you know, depending on how many species we have, we call it the three ring animal circus on wheels. Um, so, yeah, it's a it's a, a barn. Um, we built like five or six different uh, styles and prototypes now. Uh of various configurations where it allows uh, to have multiple species that are segregated into that. So they have a grazing pen, they have shelter in the barn. Barn is usually split and divided so that you can have a couple different species in there uh, at the same time. It has a, uh, a roof on it that has an inverted V that collects its own rainwater. So we get an inch of rain, we fill 110 gallons of onboard storage to automatically water. We have onboard feed that we come out and shore once every couple days. 
um, and it's solar powered. Uh, we have uh, various setups. Uh, some barns uh, have the capacity to auto steer with GPS. Uh, we have uh, uh, one of our bigger barns is on a solar powered electrically driven winch that we can advance a couple times a day. Um, and then the one that we're debuting at our field day, which will be our first commercial release, hopefully later this year, is we call the Cluster Cluck Pico. And uh, this is the Tesla of all chicken tractors that will go in your backyard. And it is designed so that um, you can, it basically makes having chickens in your backyard uh, a delight in the fact that you can chore the entire thing from outside. So, you know, Delaney, you can look super nice uh, like you do this morning and you could go out if your kids don't do the chores, you can chore everything and not get dirty and still make it to the podcast uh, on time. And so this is a barn that will autonomously be able to march itself several times a day across your yard. And uh, um, it looks super cool. I'm really proud of it. Uh, we've made a, a ton of improvements over the last year's version and uh, getting a lot of really good feedback so far. So. I'm sold. I don't think it'll help me be on time, but I like that I was, it wouldn't. Um... I was getting ready to make the joke. It was going to come out. So uh, <laughs> it, it made me to that. So Zach, what's the field day going to look like and how can our listeners get information on it? Yep. So the, the field day is going to be, this is our fifth field day that we've, uh, that we're hosting. Um, it's going to be just outside of Buffalo center, Iowa. Uh, so about, uh, two and a half hours North of Des Moines or two hours from Minneapolis to give you a reference. Um, starts at 2 PM. We're going to have a host of, uh, really interesting people there. We'll start promptly with our program at two. Uh, we're going to have plot tours. We've got Dr. Jerry Hatfield, um, retired uh, professor from, from Iowa state. Who's a fantastic, uh, soil health speaker that I've I've seen a lot of times. He's going to be our keynote. We've got folks like Jason Mock that are going to be there to help guide some of the field tours and talk about uh, not only the stock cropper system that people will be able to see in the cluster clucks, but a lot of these farm weird cropping schematics with multiple crops, uh, sweet corn, popcorn, Indian corn, field corn, uh, interplanted with soybeans, pumpkins. Uh, we have a relay soybean and oat plot, uh, we have an oat plant opening close to us that we'd like to grow more oats for. And, you know, what could we do with that type of an arrangement? And then uh, we're going to have a farmer panel uh, where Vance Crow is going to moderate that and uh, have a bunch of uh, farmers, including myself, that are doing some of this farm weird stuff for people that want to just come and ask questions and uh, about, you know, what, you know, the goal of is is to have people come in and inspire other people to go home and and, and try this stuff and put it into action and like I said, spread this kind of grassroots uh, movement of innovative farmers trying to find solutions for themselves. And and then we'll finish up uh, at the end with uh, an Iowa sweet corn and uh, pork burger uh, feed. And uh, if folks are really having a good time, I'm sure there'll be some libations that come out and we will have an option for folks if they want to camp at the site or where there's lodging, op or, uh, lodging opportunities within uh, 25 minutes of where we're at too. That sounds like a, a good time. I actually am thinking, hmm, can we make that work with our schedule? Um, Zach, I really appreciate, too, that this information is, I'm just going to say, free to the public or free to those farmers that want to come because you're interested in helping to spread what you guys are doing. But longer term, are you going to help farmers, maybe consult them on getting this set up on their operation? Can I buy the mobile grazing unit for our farm? What does that look like in the future? Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the plan is uh, to, to start to scale out uh, the cluster clucks themselves. We're going to start uh, where it's the easiest access to the market and the biggest market, which is the backyard chicken uh, space. Um, and then as we get that, we get revenue positive, then the plan is to expand into the other bigger models that would enable, um, you know, folks, if they want to have a multi-species barn. I think, you know, for even if you're not going to do the stock cropping schematic, having one of our barns, if you have, you know, f a five acre acreage and just have this thing, you know, mowing down and you grow a ton of protein, you know, I mean, you could feed several families, you know, for a year with that. And uh, that this idea of protein sovereignty of building devices that make p busy people with busy lives, uh, make it easier to um, produce their own protein and feed their families is kind of the the pivot that I see the direction of the company taking and then supporting the company, supporting, uh, helping people figure that out, uh, you know, not only with the device, but with, you know, support and information consulting, like what you're talking about. So that's great. Well, Zach, we appreciate you taking the time this morning. 
I hope all of our listeners go and check you out, especially those that, that are in the same demographic of curiosity and understand that things might need to change to make their operations work going forward. So, One other thing I would say is uh, if you want to come to our field day, go to my Twitter page, at uh, Zebulus Prime, and if you could put that in the notes, that'd be great. And then RSVP to the event, right, that we have pinned at the uh, the top so that we can have a good count for lunch. But we'd everyone's welcome. You don't have to be a farmer. Uh, if you're from the city and you just think what we're doing is interesting, come on out. We'd love to have you next uh, next Saturday outside of Buffalo Center. That's great. Thanks again, Zach. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Well, Tanner, that certainly was a fun interview there. I don't know if we'll be making it to that field day, but hopefully some of our listeners will, and maybe they can tag us on social media if they make it out to the event so we can follow along with them on social. Absolutely. It'll be a fun one if we can get there. It certainly will. But Taking a look to wrap up today's shows at the markets, we saw a pretty bearish wise to report push markets to new contract lows this week, as USDA is suggesting we'll see a record harvest from potentially both Brazil and Argentina, which will continue to contribute to oversupply of soybeans globally. Markets continue to deflate to new lows this week after touching new contract lows in several futures contracts months. Following the WASDE report, December corn traded down to $3.90 a bushel on Monday before closing the day just above $4. This $3.90 number is now the lowest touch point in new crop futures in over three years. A few shocks to the market on this month's report included the record yield of a 183.1 bushels per acre. Soybeans had a similar story this week. After trading to new contract lows as well at 9.55 on Wednesday, before closing a little bit higher at 9.68, this marks the lowest trading session in nearly four years. The Wise Report shared other bearish news for beans after estimating that the national yield would probably be around a 53.2 bushel per acre, which was above the trade average and above last month's report of a 52.5 from the July Wise Report. So. Not a lot of excitement here for the bulls to get uh, some rallying power behind. And it's going to take a lot of really major bullish news to spark some sort of life back into the grain markets, Tanner. Yeah, it certainly seems like the crop is out there. And this might be a crop that just keeps getting bigger. We also saw other notable changes on Monday's WASDE report. They included raising their estimate for the 2024-2025 soybean crop to a record of 4.589 billion bushels. That's up from 4.469 last month. If realized, this would be the third highest number on record. The USDA also increased its estimate of how much soy will be left over in the United States by autumn 2025. After export and domestic needs are covered up, a whopping 29% of the crop will be from last month up to 560 million bushels. So I think your comment about Some drastic news is going to have to happen to see these markets come back is probably fairly accurate. I think, you know, we've been looking at break even and numbers already for 2025. I think a lot of uh, other farmers are doing the same, thinking, how are we going to get through this storm? We understand commodity markets move in very cyclical patterns, but certainly not a rosy outlook when it comes to commodity markets. No, certainly isn't. But we are extremely happy to have you listening and watching us. So continue to send in your suggestions for interviews. We appreciate those. Follow us on social media and make sure you let us know you're there by commenting. Appreciate that. And thank you for sticking around. But for today, what do you say? Should we let the listeners go? Let's let them go. Let's let them go.